Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek, Thomas Jefferson scholar, philosopher, historian. And uh, today I'd like to talk to you about Thomas Jefferson's anti-city sentiments. And the talk might be provisionally titled uh, Of Mice and Men, following Steinbeck's classic work. Now, Thomas Jefferson, we all know, was no friend to cities. At least he expressed a disdain for cities. And I, I offer you several quotes here to Casper Wistar on uh, June 21, 1807. He says, I am not a friend of placing growing men in populous cities because they acquire their habits of partialities which do not contribute to the happiness of their after life. To, uh, in an earlier letter to Dr. Benjamin Rush in 1800, he writes, I view great cities as pestilential to the morals, the health, and the liberties of man. True, they nourish some of the elegant arts, but the useful ones can thrive elsewhere, and less perfection than the others with more health, virtue, and freedom would be my choice. To David Williams in 1803, during his presidency, he writes, uh, that cities, come on, Jeff, let's get up, go, come on. So cities encourage too many citizens to try to live by their heads, not by their hands. In other words, that they discourage uh, the husbandry and self-sufficiency. Um, they also bode ill for many who have a turn for dissipation. Uh, going back to the letter uh, to Rush, he uh, adds that, uh, talks about the, the uh the rise of yellow fever in Philadelphia, which wiped out many, many thousands of citizens. And uh, he waxes optimistically. This just might be God's way of discouraging, he says, the growth of great cities in our nation. Now, uh, you know, I've always been sort of sympathetic with Jefferson's anti-city sentiments for a large number of reasons. I'm not too, I'm not too happy with very, very large cities as I, uh, I agree with him that they, they don't bring out the best in people. Um, Jefferson thinks that they lead to a sort of natural decay of the human condition, uh, uh, which might be construed to be a sort of slipping away from uh, a bucolic ideal that he championed, the agrarian ideal. Um, you know, uh, that's not to say that he thought all manufacture was worthless, and, and, and you know he didn't. He thought that you know some degree of manufacture was necessary uh, for self-sufficiency, even from a farmer's way of life. Jeff, what do you want? Come on, up. He's got to get up. Okay, even from a farmer's perspective, there needs to be some uh, implementations for farming. You need plows, you need uh, uh, scythes, and other things just to uh, to bring in the you know, to be able to plow the fields and bring in the yield, bring in the wheat and so forth. So, um, and there are other needed things or things that people want that uh, we need. So some degree of manufacture, he concedes, is necessary. Um, to, um, in his notes on Virginia, 1787, published, uh, finally published in English, the last publication, the last version, he says, the mobs of great cities add just so much to the support Court of pure government as sores do to the strength of the human body. Um, and then he says to James Madison in the same year, right at the end of December, he says, I think we shall be virtuous as long as agriculture is our principal object, which will be the case while there remain vacant lands in any part of America. When we get piled upon one another in large cities as in Europe, we shall become corrupt as in Europe and go to eating one another as they do there. I, I think he certainly thought that the sort of uh, bellicosity, the belligerency that we find in France and England is due to the overcrowding in London and in Paris. I think that's a, a reasonable thing during his stay in Paris. He talked of the sort of lethargy, the malaise of, of, uh, of uh, aristocratic French women. And he talked of people being, you know, he says, following Voltaire's observation, everybody in Paris is either a hammer or the anvil. Um, so his disdain of uh, aristocracy, his disdain of manufacturing goods that were not useful as they did, you know, people need jobs. So they manufacture items that are not of little use. It might even lead to human dissipation. So in the great cities, what you find, you find prostitution, you find gambling, you find abuse of alcohol. 
uh, and things like that. All the things that Jefferson, you, you know, Jefferson is not partial to any of those things, we should say. Um, and, you know, I, and I add, Jefferson adds a stirring observation in Query 17 right at the end. And he, you know, I've, I've written about this quite often. I don't quite get why he puts it where he puts it, but he says, from the conclusion of this war, we shall be going downhill. The people and their rights will be forgotten. They will forget themselves, but in the sole faculty of making money, will never think of uniting to affect due respect for their rights. Uh, Jefferson, of course, always thought that people had to fight for their rights. You couldn't trust those governing you to, to worry about your rights because at some point in the process, in the act of governing, people who are governing will think for them, think about themselves and think of their own well-being, not of my well-being and your well-being. Now, here I want to mark a really a, a seismic shift in, in, the, in, in the talk. Uh, I want to refer to a wonderful 1973 paper uh, titled Death Squared, the Explosive Growth and Demise of a Mouse Population, hence my title of Mice and Men. And this was a very, very famous uh, paper by ethologist John Calhoun, who began research on mice and rats, rodents, uh, in 1947, continued all the way through 1972. And the research in my estimation, has been profoundly uh, important, singular, All right? So he starts off, the idea here is to create a, a mouse utopia. So he creates a large, enormously large room for mice. It's 2.7 meters square. It's got four separate interconnected pens um, and um, 256 apartments for living. You know, each apartment can fit some 15 mice and there are 16 tunnels that lead to nourishment and access ramps through this universe. So the idea here for Calhoun is to create a mouse utopia. There's no concern about predators. There's no concern about having to struggle to survive. Uh, there's no concern about fighting the elements. It's just, uh, you know, and the, the notion here is Calhoun's thinking, of course, just what will this tell us about humans living in a sort of similar style utopia. So he places a certain number of mice, small number of mice in this great utopia and watches what happens. So he notices that by the uh, up to the 104th day, there is an adjustment phase where the mice are trying to get acclimated to their new environment, right? Um, then after this adjustment phase, there is what he calls an exploit period, where the mice population has acclimated to the new environment, and the population doubles uh, every 55 days and grows to 620 mice in, a, in, a, in a, an apartment, as it were, that can house comfortably uh, 3,000 mice. That's the, the whole notion. So. Uh, 620 mice, you can't say that the accommodations are at this point cramped. Okay, day 315. Um, he notices that the male mice become socially somewhat maladept, right? Uh, they, they no longer protect the females. They become outcast from all sorts of groups. They just merely tend to wander off into the center of the universe for, for eating, to get food, to fight among themselves for no obvious reason. Uh, they, <laughs> the male mice mount other mice, whether it's male or female, it doesn't matter, and so forth. So um, they, they show very little interest in uh, protecting in, in females and protecting the females and the offspring. So what happens is they, they they have a sort of hyper sexual, hyper violent reaction in the male mice at this time, a sort of indolence, but you know, hyper aggressive, hyper sexual, hyper violent, even the, without having, they lose their social instincts and become socially mal maladept. Okay, now the female, female mice uh, no longer have the protection of the male mice, so they become aggressive, right? Uh, overly so in terms of protecting their young, but at some point th that protection becomes uh, 
a sort of intolerance for the offspring, and they, they ignore their young in some cases and cast off their young, uh, and sometimes even aggressively uh, behave aggressively with their young and, and kill them. So we have, uh, by the 315 days, um, we have a sort of uh, hyper-aggressive and indifferent male population, and then a hyper-aggressive female population that uh, even attack their own young. That's uh, day 560. At this point, Calhoun notices that the populational increase is gone. There, there is a sort of uh, 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 the population is, is not increasing at all, and it's beginning uh, its decline, okay? And, and by the 600th day, he calls it the death phase, right? The behavior here is violent, hypersexual, uh, lack of concern, all lack of concern for social roles and so forth. Um, there's uh, no more courting, there's no more mating, there's no protecting. There's uh, no, no fighting to protect. There's no rearing the young going on. So all uh, semblance of any kind of social roles for the mice seems to be completely gone. Now, the females lose interest in reproducing. Uh, the indifferent males really just you know, hang out at the center. They, they eat, sleep, and they groom themselves. And Calhoun calls them the beautiful ones because they can become completely uh, egocentric. I'm just going to eat, sleep, and just groom myself, right? Sort of like what we do right now in our man caves, right? <laughs> Not have our man caves time off from work and just sit around and watch TV, you know, on our big screen TV and do nothing. Anyway, I, I digress, okay? Uh, so Calhoun calls this the first death. It's a sort of waiting around for the eventuality of real demise, a real death, which might be dubbed, he calls the second death. So by day 920, there are 2,200 mice uh, in an accommodation, that, that, in, a, in a place that can accommodate 300. Uh, all the pot mice are completely uncaring and asocial, socially maladept. Uh, he calls this the behavioral sink, which is a rapid decline in the population that would, will very quickly lead to their extinction. Calhoun sums this behavioral sink. For animals so simple as a mouse, the most complex behaviors involve the interrelated set of courtship, maternal care, territorial defense, and hierarchical intragroup and intergroup social organization. When behaviors related to these functions fail to mature, there is no development of social organization, no reproduction. Hence, Calhoun asserts there is quick distinction. And what does this have to do with human populations? Um, Calhoun writes, and I read again from him, if opportunities for role fulfillment fall short of the demand by those capable of fulfilling roles and having expectancies to do so, only violence and disruption of social organization can follow. Individuals born under these circumstances will be so out of touch with reality as to be incapable even of alienation. They will be, <laughs> in a matter of speaking, they're indifferent to social activity and they're indifferent to a social activity. They just float about, they just completely a bromidic existence. The most complex behaviors will become fragmented. Acquisition, creation, and utilization of ideals appropriate for life in a post-industrial, cultural, conceptual, technological society will have been blocked. Just as biological generation in the mouse evolves the species, most complex behaviors so does ideational generativity for man. Loss of these respective complex behaviors means death for the species. Now, um, what to say about this? Uh, the suggestion here is that human beings, like other social creatures, are sort of biologically hardwired for social interaction. And the exigencies of uh, 
the environment of our external environment create opportunities for danger as well as safety. And there seems to be some necessity for uh, exposure to both and so for, for social behaviors to kept. Yeah, but the idea here is that, you know, the idea here is imagine we all hope for a sort of utopic uh, existence, uh, Moore's utopia. And all, many writers in Jefferson's day and Jefferson himself, in my estimation, with this view of global republicanism is looking for the sort of uh, global uh, uh, utopia. Um, Calhoun's experiment suggests at least that that might be an impossibility. It might not be a good thing for humans, right? Uh, it also shows, I think, quite strongly that cramped spaces, that living in cities like New York and Chicago, Chicago's not as bad because it's spread out more, but any kind of cramped city living in Los Angeles is not good for, for human thriving, okay? Um, so are we in a behavioral sync phase of human existence in the cities in which we live? Uh, 20 million in Mexico City, uh, how many, many tens of million in New York and Los Angeles and so forth. Uh, it may be, um, and maybe this is what Jefferson had in mind when he talked about, um, you know, at the end of a chap of query 17, when he talked about the human beings going downhill because they're only interested in making money, right? Uh, not fighting for their rights and so forth. Uh, that may or may not be the case, but I don't know. But I, the, the suggestion here is that we have um, we have uh, the wonderful experiment of this great ethologist that suggests that uh, Jefferson's anti-city sentiments might not be so illy founded. There might be some truth to the notion that cities are just not good for human health and human thriving and human happiness. So I leave you with that thought. So Jefferson perhaps was not so bad. I say ta-ta for now, and Jefferson was perhaps not such a false prophet, but his views might be uh, wonderfully ap applicable today. I will uh, address this in another talk on cities, and Jefferson talking about the geometry or the architecture of cities in another talk. So ta-ta for now, and I hope you enjoyed this, and please share this video if you and like it. Thank you very much, and have a great afternoon.